Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We're delighted to have with us this afternoon, Professor Patricia Sullivan, to talk about her uh, new book, Justice Rising, Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Justice Rising. Now, Pat is a professor of history at the University of South Carolina, where she specializes in modern US history with a focus on African-American history, race relations, and the history of the civil rights movement. Her several previous books have addressed the history of the NAACP, the rise and fall of a movement during the New Deal era to broaden the base of political participation in the South, and the collected letters of civil rights champion Virginia Foster Durer. In Justice Rising, Pat offers a reconsideration of Robert Kennedy, framing his public life in relation to the civil rights movement and placing him near the center of our nation's struggle for racial justice. She portrays Kennedy as growing from an idealistic but naive young man into a passionate and sophisticated advocate for racial justice. Her book is deeply researched and intended, as she says at the outset, to challenge and upend some of the interpretations that have shaped our understanding of the 1960s. A review in Kirkus called the work a sharp portrayal of the potential of the 1960s through the lens of RFK. And Publishers Weekly commended the book as an immersive and eye-opening history. Conversation with Pat will be Peter Edelman, law professor at Georgetown University, where he's been on the faculty for nearly 40 years. He's also served in all three branches of government, beginning his career working for Robert Kennedy in the Justice Department and going on to serve as a legislative aide in Kennedy's Senate office. And yes, he does appear in Pat's book. So uh, Pat and Peter, the screen is yours. Thank you, Brad. Um, th thank you so much. I know Pat will uh, agree that uh, to be here for politics and prose. Uh, I just wanna say uh, to, to get us started, that this is a wonderful book. Uh, absolutely, there's so much detail there. Uh, and uh, we're going to ask some questions and more important, some answers, uh, but you can't cover the whole book. Uh, so, uh, and it's got a lot of pages and they're all really, really interesting and you can't cover every, every, everything. So uh, wonderful that everybody is here, uh, but absolutely uh, everybody has to buy the book because uh, you can't learn it just from uh, Pat, even though you're going to learn a lot. Uh, let me let me just start, uh, Pat. Uh, this is a, a uh, <laughs> always there to begin with. Uh, in particularly, uh, one might say, why another book on Robert Kennedy? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the answer uh, is uh, the well. I won't ask the answer. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what drew you to, to this subject? Thank you, Peter. And thanks so much for joining me tonight. And as you say to politics and prose for um, hosting this discussion. Um, I didn't set out to write a book about Robert Kennedy. Uh, as Brad mentioned, my work has been on African-American history, the struggle for civil rights. Uh, and I, my book before this book was the history of the NACP, which covered the decades from the founding in 1910 up through the 1950s. And it was really, it's a remarkable story of the development of the civil rights struggles in this country on, on multiple fronts. I mean, in the South as Jim Crow took hold and disfranchisement, but also during these decades, uh, African-Americans were migrating to cities in the North and the West where they met increasing segregation, um, and uh, segregation became increasingly entrenched over these decades. And by 1960, where this book begins, by 1960, half of African-Americans lived outside of the South um, in northern urban areas. 
where they were uh, segregated, not by law, but by custom, housing, schools, jobs, and the rest. So uh, I wanted to take a fresh look at the 1960s, um, not as a decade that sort of looks at civil rights and then black power, but as a decade of racial reckoning, uh, really facing problems of racial discrimination and segregation across the country. Um, and in my readings and thinking about how it approached this subject, Robert Kennedy came up a couple of times. Once his famous meeting with James Baldwin in 1963, which I thought was pretty interesting that he, that he had that meeting that, that was pretty uh, intense. And then when he gave that remarkable address the night that Dr. King uh, was killed. Uh, and the more I read, I realized that Robert Kennedy was a way in was a way to really look at uh, through his, as he moves the decade, this intersection of history, race, and politics. It really makes this the 60s such a transformative period. Uh, one thing I might say, Pat, uh, to the people who are here, uh, she's not going to, unless uh, it comes up, but, but uh, there's a lot about uh, RFK's uh, life uh, before 1960, and, and it's very, very important yes. uh, it, because uh, you learn a lot about why he uh, is and, uh, and, and, and why he changes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would see uh, what we're going to do here, Pat, is about half uh, for when he was uh, in, in the uh, Justice Department uh, and about half when he was senator. Okay. Uh, that, that seemed uh, right. So maybe um, you could take us uh, first uh, on the uh, the JFK Robert Kennedy part of it. Uh, we used to hear, we do hear uh, now uh, that uh, jumping into the question of race and, and civil rights, that they uh, didn't do enough to to support. Uh, the civil rights uh, movement, um, and uh, well, tell us about that. Is was that right, or how do you challenge that? No, well, I had sort of assumed that myself, based on just sort of the received wisdom. And no, it's it's not accurate at all. Um, what I found by the time they came into government in 1961, even before that, um, both John and Robert Kennedy had begun to face the racial reality of our country. And how did they come to see it? Because we have to remember what America was like in 1960. Uh, you know, the South, uh, massive resistance to school desegregation, segregation across the country, white Americans really not interested in this issue. And a, a Congress uh, where the Democratic Party was dominated by powerful Southern Democrats. Um, so uh, one interesting, really interesting interview I found uh, early on was an interview with Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was most of our listeners, I'm sure know, was sort of the architect of Brown, and at this time in 1960, as head of the LDF. And Marshall went to see Senator Kennedy, when he was then a candidate in the spring of 1960, asked Marshall to come to his office um, for lunch. And so Marshall went, and he recalled, I was there all afternoon. And Kennedy really talked with him. Uh, and what Thurgood Marshall saw was that John Kennedy knew all about voting problems, registration problems. He knew all about the struggle around school desegregation and the problems. And Marshall concluded that he, Senator Kennedy, was uh, committed to civil rights and equality for all. That that was a commitment. And Marshall felt he would do more than the normal politician in addressing this issue. And I think what bears this out is one of his first appointments after he's elected is his brother as attorney general. And I um, interviewed John Siegenthal, who was in the room when uh, John Kennedy told Bobby Kennedy that he wanted him to be his attorney general, not something, RFK was not looking for a job in the administration. And he said to him, uh, JFK did, look, so, you know, civil rights is going to be a major issue. And he looked at Siegenthal, who was from Tennessee, uh, and he said, and I need someone in this position who I can trust, who will tell me the unvarnished truth, and who, who will join me in making the tough decisions and, and, and doing, uh, you know, pushing things forward. And he said in that meeting, 
We have got to change the climate in this country. And if I do this, I need someone who's gonna be with me and who I can rely on completely. And as I go on to find out in my research, and most people know, Robert Kennedy in the Justice Department turned that into just an engine for trying to enforce voting rights laws, enforce school desegregation, and then really ultimately coming into alignment with the Southern Movement uh, during that period of the Kennedy administration. Uh, so they, I guess the, the, in conclusion, and we can talk more about what Robert Kennedy actually does in the Justice Department, but they were prepared to face this issue. That, that's huge at this moment in 1960-61. And they were prepared to do what they could. But I think what has to be uh, recognized is what they faced. Much like today, there, there are things that President Biden wants to get through, but you have a, a legislative process. Uh, and, and in 1960-61, you had a country where this issue was not of concern to most, many white Americans, and you had African Americans in the South largely disenfranchised. Well, let's take us through uh, uh, some of the things uh, that uh, the president and Robert Kennedy uh, did, uh, led by, by Robert Kennedy, uh, over that uh, from the uh, 61 uh, until uh, the uh, terrible death of JFK. Uh, and so some, some details, uh, obviously you can't cover everything. Um, but uh, it's just a few things to, and you can mention other things perhaps, but, but uh, uh, the connection of John Doerr, because he connects so clearly to what Robert Kennedy was doing in, in DOJ. Um, and and uh, the, the uh, what happened with the freedom riders? So much, of, uh, so important. Uh, um, I was thinking about Bob Moses because he mm -hmm. passed away just uh, the other day. Uh, and uh, just a couple more, but you want to go on perhaps to others. Uh, James Meredith and Mississippi, uh, George Wallace, uh, and and. Uh, you, all of these things, and of course, the the legislation uh, is is enormously important. Uh, the sixty four Act. So, could you tell us uh, some of the things that that the consequences of his uh, of what he was developing uh, as he starts in the Attorney General uh, in in all of those things uh, he grows so quickly and, and so, so full. I mean, the, the learning uh, is incredible, really. Well, I think the key point is he's ready to move and he does learn. He's exposed to so much as attorney general. Um, but on the first day when he arrives at the Justice Department, he goes, as you mentioned, to John Doerr's desk and says, what are you working on? And it was a case, a voting case in Louisiana. And uh, we're you know, I won't get into it, but Kennedy immediately said, let's get on that. And he's, you know, we're a black farmer was, uh, because he testified before the Civil Rights Commission about being denied the vote, um, you know, couldn't gin his cotton, couldn't get credit. And they pursued that case immediately. And, and Robert Kennedy put uh, voting rights, since we had Civil Rights Act of 57 and 60, they gave the Justice Department a little more leverage in trying to enforce the right to vote. And he really, um, with John Doerr, they quadrupled the number of attorneys over the course of, of a couple of years and created a field team to litigate those cases. And believing too that voting, by opening up the vote and, and getting people voting, that's the best way to really change the South and to change the political complexion. And of course, you mentioned Bob Moses, who John Doerr worked closely with and the Justice Department allied with them in Mississippi. Um, and it, it, the obstruction at all levels was, was a learning experience that you could have the laws and you could litigate. But, um, you know, if you can't get to court and get it through court, nothing happens. The Freedom Rides is a really important moment. That's four months into the administration. And um, riders go down because the Supreme Court uh, said that you couldn't segregate on interstate travel in stops and an early decision that you couldn't surrogate on the buses. And they meet tremendous violence. 
and law enforcement that stands by uh, and a governor that refuses to use state power to protect these riders. And I think for Robert Kennedy, uh, that, that, that was astounding to see this level of lawlessness uh, by top public officials. And he said to John Doerr after the Freedom Rides, uh, those fellows, speaking of the governor and uh, police chiefs, those fellows are at war with this country. So they see what they're up against early on in terms of, you know, these uh, in the South, as people are pushing, the movement's pushing, and this resistance is, is terrific. And so the point about learning, they're learning about how this works. I mean, no one had really gone, no president had really faced this in the wake of, especially in the wake of massive resistance. And so what do you do? And what I see is, you know, Kennedy and his team in the Justice Department using all the tools at their disposal with the support of the president. In 1962, they introduced the Civil Rights Act that doesn't get mentioned very much. And they said, we have to do something. And of course it was filibustered, you know, and Mike Mansfield, someone said to him, Burke Marshall, so how do, what do we tell the people about not being able to get this act through? He said, tell the people, you're not gonna get a Civil Rights Act with a Democratic president. So they're tremendous obstacles, but they keep pushing. And I think what's key is when Birmingham occurs, and there's so much violence all through this period, Greenwood, Mississippi, I mean, and, and it, the country, this is being exposed to the country, but when Birmingham happens, with Dr. King and the protests there, and uh, Bull Connor turns the hoses and dogs on young protesters, the nation sees this and the Kennedy brothers, and it really, they realize they have a chance to move, that this has been exposed nationally. And they also see there are demonstrations across the country that African-Americans have had it. And we're at a real breaking point. I mean, James Baldwin publishes The Fire Next Time early in 1963. So it's a very tense moment, but they're seeing an opportunity. And, and that's what I came to learn, you know, that they responded not just to the demands, but the opportunities created by the movement to push forward. Uh, and as you say, Peter, learning all the way and learning how to use what, what they had, what power they had and they could marshal to, um, to get uh, the power to get a strong civil rights bill through that very few people thought they would be able to do. Maybe just a little bit more on the 64 Act, what it is. Uh, I, yes, not everybody yeah. knows. No, the 64 Civil Rights Act, which again was written over a weekend after the police riots in Birmingham um, by a team in the Justice Department. And, um, and basically it had, it had a number of uh, provisions, but the main one was ending segregation in uh, public facilities and privately owned public facilities uh, in the South. So this ending legally mandated segregation uh, also included equal economic opportunity, it expanded to include women uh, and, and some voting rights measures was not as strong as we get uh, the next year with the Voting Rights Act in 65. Um, but still, when the president decided this, they were gonna go forward with this, Robert Kennedy was the only <laughs> person, uh, and of course he was one pushing for it, who thought it was a good thing to do. Uh, even Vice President Johnson didn't think they could get it through a filibuster, that they could surmount a filibuster. And so what they did was they realized they needed Republicans. They needed a bipartisan, uh, coalition to support this legislation and they built it. I mean, it's a remarkable story how they, how they pulled that together, uh, negotiated a bill that remained a strong bill and also began to try to um, involve interested uh, sectors of the public. President Kennedy had meetings with lawyers groups, women's groups, clergy to really get sort of mobilization outside of the government to pressure the support and um, and so this is the spring of 63 through the summer. I mean, on June 11th, President Kennedy makes his remarkable civil rights speech, which I urge everyone to read if they haven't, uh, which again talks about the breadth and depth of the racial problem in this country, national cities, the South. Uh, and he and Robert Kennedy wrote that speech minutes before he gave it. It was the day that George Wallace stood in the doorhouse and, and uh, finally Alabama was desurrogated. So it was a very tense and uh, tense time, but they knew what, he knew what he wanted to say that night and they had been talking about it and, and they said it and he introduced the bill 
And uh, of course it was, you know, wheeling and dealing and, and challenges, but it held. And there was one point when it nearly fell apart, um, but they were able to pull the Republicans back. And when President Kennedy left for Texas, uh, on November 20th, the bill went to the, was passed to the Judiciary Committee um, and President Kennedy left the next day for Texas. And that was the bill, it would be another um, eight months before it finally got through and passed the filibuster. But that was the bill that was actually uh, passed pretty much as it was. And with that bipartisan coalition that the Kennedy administration had built. And of course, President Johnson supported it going forward and put his weight behind it. But I think it's really important to realize how, um, you know, where the bill came from and how uh, the Kennedy administration had, uh, you know, through these lawyers and through all the work they had been doing from the start in 61, were able to see and craft the kind of bill that was needed um, and to build the support uh, that would, would get it through. Yeah, we should underline that you had to have 67 votes uh, in the Senate then, uh, not 60 as it is now. And uh, the Republicans, of course, had a very large number of people in the South who wouldn't vote for it. So the number of, Republic of Republicans had to be... Uh, 25. Uh, yeah. So 25. Say again for everybody gets this. 25. Uh, they, they needed 25 Republicans, at least. Yeah. To yeah. The yeah. So important. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? I want to move on because uh, we have uh, many other things, but but you can say a last word on. on well, but, uh, but a last word about as we move on. I think this is important to recognize about Robert Kennedy, who will car carry on um, with his public life. That early in '63, he gave a speech on the hundredth anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he really. Uh, indicated his understanding because he had been working with youth in cities. Had, he had really started paying attention to the problems of segregation, poverty, discrimination, policing in America's cities. Um, and in this speech, he, he said, the problems that remain are massive. The results of racial discrimination carry on from generation after generation. To face this openly and meet it squarely is the challenge of this decade. So it wasn't just about ending Jim Crow in the South. This was a national problem. And he described a racial crisis 100 years in the making. I mean, dating it back to when the Reconstruction Amendments was supposed to provide full citizenship rights for the emancipated um, former slaves and how that was overturned and, and, uh, and really denied. And so in the 1960s, this is the legacy that the country faces. And, and the challenges that, um, that exist. And as we go forward um, with, with the uprisings and disturbances in the cities, this really comes up front and center um, by the mid 1960s. A lot to say about all of this. Uh, and, and so you've said a lot and we know that there's much more there. Uh, let me move on to uh, President um, is murdered. Um, and uh, one of the things that we hear um, about Robert Kennedy at that point, uh, that uh, some people uh, to this day say that uh, Robert Kennedy uh, wasn't very interested in, in these issues. Well, you just said about race rather clearly. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, I'm uh, my thing is is uh, uh, poverty and of course also also race, uh, but just in generally the some people said well he was just uh, you know not interested in good important things and so on and then that he's that he's killed uh, his brother is killed and that he comes out as a as a different person. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, I'll stop with that because uh, you know I could end the sentence, but then you're the one who wrote the book. Well, uh, so uh, tell us what what you found in, in uh, as you did the research and, right. and came to your own conclusions. Right. Well, you know, by the time President Kennedy was assassinated, it was clear that Robert Kennedy was deeply committed uh, to, to these issues and 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 facing them. I think that's the key thing, facing them and continuing to learn. He faced the problems in the South and by 63, he had a very 
clear understanding of what uh, had built had, had been established in urban areas across decades, the deep entrenched nature of racial segregation and what it resulted in terms of poverty, poor housing, uh, lack of jobs, poor schools, uh, that this was a crisis. And, um, and poverty, as you mentioned, Peter, was, was central, race and poverty intertwined in these conditions, but they were you know, a product of history of decades of, of, of segregation and exclusion and uh, really, um, and, and white indifference to all of this. So in terms of his brother's assassination, it was traumatic uh, for Robert Kennedy. And as, um, as you know, and, and so I, I, I was anxious to see how he continues on in, in these areas, um, but no, he wasn't changed. I mean, he, uh, as Burke Marshall, as people close to him, and that's where I looked to, I looked at interviews and I talked with John Siegenthaler, who was close with Robert Kennedy, um, he, um, he was the same person. In fact, his law professor, um, Mortimer Kaplan, who I got to interview, who had worked in the IRS and became a good friend of Robert Kennedy's, he said, you know, he was like the blocking back for his brother. Um, but I think you've got to know him better after his brother's death. He became more and more himself. You know, he didn't have to be juggling that. He was just fully engaged in the issues that uh, concerned him and um, moving forward, you know, outside of the power of being in the White House and, 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 and working uh, with his brother. So you knew a lot from, from what, what he did in 64. Uh, and, and of course, uh, it is true that when he loses his brother, uh, the, the deep, deep, deep uh, effect on him. And you can't even say those uh, words. And the other thing is he's, he's you sort of said it, but just to underline, uh, he's, up, he's doing this for himself now. He's not, not doing it for his his brother. So what does that look like? Uh, he's on, he's in charge for himself now. Right. And as, and thanks, he worked on a Senate campaign. I mean, he's elected to the Senate in uh, 1964, takes a seat in January of 1965. And he's coming into that role as his country is ending, what, entering one of its most challenging periods. I mean, uh, the Watts uprising is that August, and there had been other disturbances the previous year. Uh, President Johnson escalates, really Americanizes the war in Vietnam, tremendous disruption and um, uh, chaos. Uh, so he's there at the, at the start of that. And I think one thing, and, and, and Peter, you might talk a little bit about going out to California with him, but in response to the, the uprising in Watts, and, and I'm sure most people are familiar with it. I mean, it was triggered by an encounter with a police officer and a, a young driver. and uh, and it just took off and exploded. And it was this pent up um, you know, frustration, anger at, at just the police brutality, uh, conditions. Uh, it was an explosion over four days of battles between residents and police. And uh, 34 people were killed, 25 African-American, uh, thousands wounded, people arrested. And, and the country was just transfixed by this. Um, lots of property damage, and the response pretty much across the board was law and order. You know, that, oh, you know, this is like, and Robert Kennedy said, as a senator, how can you ask the Negro, Negroes to obey the law? To them, the law is the enemy. It's almost always been used against them. And he's not just talking about policing, he's talking about being cheated by landlords and markets and just not... And there you go. I mean, that's what he sees, that this is not just, a, it's a problem of these conditions in these areas, in these cities, and the need for the war on poverty and the country to face it and to begin to uh, work to, uh, to remedy these conditions. Um, but I know you went out with uh, the Senator to Watts uh, later that fall. I mean, the, the, the uprising was in August. Did you want to say well, just take a quickie because you're you should be talking, uh, and and it's it's in a way a small thing, but it's a big thing. Uh, and I mean, the overall thing you've made clear is that he, apart from and you can't say apart, but the war on Vietnam, 
uh, is going on at, at the same time. I mean, er, everything is uh, uh, going on at the same time and they relate to each other. But uh, he is so complete, complete to, connected to uh, race and poverty and poverty and race. So mm -hmm. that's partly white and, and uh, the race is, 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 is kind of special. Well, uh, what Pat's talking about, uh, I went out to uh, LA uh, in, in, uh, after uh, all of this happened uh, in Watts and he had a speech out there and, and uh, I was just being his, uh, working for him and doing, supporting him. Uh, and so he had given this speech and he said to me, uh, let, let, let's go see Watts. Now think about this. Uh, he he gets in a, in a taxi with me, uh, and he says, "Where should we go?" Well, there's this wonderful place uh, out in Watts where where there's a a, uh, a thing made out of Coca Cola. <laughs> it's a a power a, power, a, a big tower, uh, and he just starts walking. There's there's no there's no police. There's no security. There's nothing. Uh, and he walks to people and people are looking at him, oh my God, that guy. And he starts talking with people. Um, and it's just so powerful. I mean, this is what he would do uh, really all the time to, to talk to people, to listen to people about what they thought about things. And this is a per particularly because it's particularly important, but it's also because it's so, so typical. Uh, so uh, he, the one thing that I remember uh, is he's talking to the, a man on, on the, on the uh, uh, sidewalk and uh, he says, what do you think? And the guy says, well, I'll tell you, it's just frustration. And that stuck with me for uh, 50 years. Anyway, that's my little story to go in there to uh, stick it in there. Thank you for doing that. No, and, and it was about the jobs. You wanted to say that I'm, 50, I'm a 50 year old man and I, I can't work. I can't get a job. Yes. And, yes. And, 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 and Peter, you described it looked like a war zone. It's a bombed out war zone. Yes. Well, well ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Physical, that's why that's why he went. And, yeah. and uh, he certainly had a strong uh, uh, back about that. Uh, and it is true uh, also that in his uh, uh, development, um, he starts out uh, as, a, as a senator more on education. Now, he didn't stop doing that, but it became clear to him that he, that, that, the, that the Congress, that the country needed to put money for jobs, just what you just said. And uh, actually not so much uh, thought, but he, he did, uh, try to get a, a, a bill uh, passed uh, on creating jobs. And of course it was, it was uh, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, uh, who hated him. And uh, he, he said, uh, no, we won't, we won't have that bill. Uh, but, uh, but Kennedy was pushing job creation uh, which, which was a major, major thing. And he, he was, I mean, it, it comes back from, from the de uh, depression in the thirties, but he was really bringing it back up here. And that, that was very important. Mm -hmm. And I think you make a good point by mentioning President Johnson, because I think another point that I was interested to learn more about my book, I mean, everyone talks about how uh, President Johnson and Robert Kennedy despise each other. And that seems to fascinate people, you know, that, that, that notion. But, but the point is, on, on just this issue you've mentioned, Peter, they were very different in how they approached these challenges that emerge in the wake of the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then the Voting Rights Act and, and the real crisis in America's cities. Um, and, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy was all for the war on poverty. Um, but what, what happens, and this is where he and King become increasingly closely aligned, is that the war on poverty, as Dr. King said, was scarcely a skirmish. I mean, it, it, the money was being siphoned off for the war in Vietnam. And also the programs weren't coordinated to really deal with the, the problems in the cities. How do you, you know, begin to, to, to correct um, the kinds of neglect and discrimination across several generations uh, where people are without jobs and haven't had access to education, terrible housing, 
it's, you know, Robert Kennedy would say you have to grab the, the web whole. You have to deal with the entire structure of community life and, and get people involved in working in their communities with the support of the government and other segments of the society to begin to remedy this. And Bedford Stuyvesant was the great uh, project that he initiated. He said, you know, people like me just can't give speeches. We need to do something. And, and I think, you know, Robert Kennedy is known for his eloquence and, and his words, but he was a doer, you know, I, I think he really acted. And, um, but, but on this issue, but so in 66, you have more uh, urban disturbances, I mean, in Omaha and Des Moines, Iowa, as well as cities. And it's just, you know, it's, it's escalating. And there's this real sense of urgency that, that there has to be leadership uh, at the federal level and other sectors, and it's not being provided um, by President Johnson. And in fact, he sort of blames these uprisings on uh, African Americans and warns them that they're going to damage the gains of the civil rights movement, seeing it as a black problem than a problem for the country. And Robert Kennedy recognized it was a problem for the country, and particularly for white Americans who are indifferent, ignorant, and being manipulated by politicians to see this as. Uh, the old lens of black criminality and and the rest so it was a huge challenge and both he you know king goes to chicago i mean they're really working to try to develop ways to begin to to turn uh turn this around and uh and, and it's really fascinating these years because uh by 67 when you have the summer of 165 urban yeah you know, it just it accumulates and 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 you see Kennedy, King, and others really uh, struggling to get um, the traction to begin to address this um, very difficult challenge and President Johnson being subsumed by the war in Vietnam. And, and uh, Kennedy had a, a much stronger uh, things to do about all of this, as you said, than uh, Johnson. Uh, quite, quite different in how they, uh, uh, looked at those things. And, and I would, we, we're almost at our question here, but I, I want to bring up uh, one point that, again, you're involved in this is one way we're hearings, I mean, the Ribicoff hearings that uh, they had for six weeks on the urban problem. And this is a year and a half before the Kernick Commission report. Everything that was found out in the Kernick Commission report was put forward before these hearings, using the hearings to educate themselves and to show the public. And then he was at Joe Clark's committee where they had field hearings in Appalachia on Indian reservations, migrant labor camps, uh, Watts, and in Mississippi. And the first field hearings, you accompanied him to Mississippi in April of 1967. And, um, and again, that going, seeing, listening, learning, Benny Lou Hamer testifies at the hearing, Amzie Moore, uh, and then they go into the Delta to see. And might you like to comment on that, Peter, before we find out? Well, I think you said it. I mean, uh, it's a long story because that's when I met my wife. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, the, the, uh, apart from, you can't be apart from that, but but uh, it, you're, you, what you're talking about is so important. Uh, how every part of it, he, he sees, he, he, he listens, and, and, and he's always coming back to wherever it is, not only supporting them when he goes to those places where not even the senator from that state had been to those low income people, but he would have ideas for uh, what to do, what to do, uh, bills and, and other kinds of things. It was all uh, new ideas. And I say that particularly in Mississippi because uh, he goes to Mississippi and he finds that there are people there who are almost starvation. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Uh, and and uh, it, it's because of what was happening in the partition. They're trying to get rid of black people and get them out of the out of the out of the state. Who were you know? Well, they were doing very very evil. Um, and that bringing that out to, to the, the the country uh, ends up with the food stamp program. Uh, directly to that, now, other people worked on it and so on. And in fact, it was Nixie, Nixon. Nixon because uh, Johnson wouldn't do it, uh, that Nixon sent a, a bill uh, t to uh, uh, the Congress uh, to make that for uh, at this national program. Uh, so thank you for that. That's, yeah. that's just one enormous, uh, enormous thing. 
Uh, I wonder if we have time to any more. Um, do, do you want to get any other question in here? We we could talk about Martin King um, maybe before we stop. Yes, very briefly, yeah, because I think we maybe go for another few minutes uh, and then uh, answer our question and uh, talk about the questions that people have. Um, but I, that was another really uh, interesting part of my research was the nature, the changing nature of their relationship across this period. Um, you know, during the Kennedy administration, I mean, they, King was, I mean, they would, they met during the Freedom Rides when King was in that church that really got burned down. And, you know, King was lobbying and, and pushing on the Kennedy administration to, you know, act, enact civil rights legislation. And, and so they, they sort of aligned to a certain extent. But in this period, after 19, uh, after Robert Kennedy went into the Senate, uh, around the issues of the cities, poverty, and the war in Vietnam, I mean, they came in such close alignment. And maybe I'll uh, tell the story, Peter, for you, or to start it. I mean, what, to, and, and people always do bring up the wiretapping in 63, in October of 63, when Hoover was pressuring Robert Kennedy and he finally agreed to a temporary wiretap on Dr. King's telephone. Um, but of course the temporary President Kennedy was killed and that never got revisited um, after that. But uh, I think, you know, I write about that in the book and, and it's, you know, the pressures of Hoover, other reasons, uh, Robert Kennedy did not think Dr. King was a communist and President Kennedy didn't either. Um, but it, anyway, that's its own, Peace. But as they move through this period, I think their um, the nature of their concerns and their courage and their ability to speak to the nation about these issues and the interconnections of race and poverty and the war in Vietnam, I think it is really remarkable. And you were there at Hickory Hill when Marion was on her way back to Mrs. to Atlanta to see Dr. King in the summer of 1967. And I think it's just so interesting how this idea about the poor people's campaign was something they shared. Maybe you can end it up with, with that, because I think that really underscores how by this time they are thinking so similarly and, and feeling something, something more needs to be done. Well, it's important uh, in substantively, uh, for sure, uh, and also what, what you're saying, that, that they uh, did come to uh, working together uh, when they had had perhaps questions to each other in the past. Uh, and the specific thing is that uh, my uh, wife, not then yet, but wife, liked uh, Robert Kennedy a lot, and he uh, came out with me, uh, she and I came out to Robert Kennedy, and, and we had lunch, uh, and uh, she said, what are you going to do next? And um, uh, uh, Kennedy asked, and, and uh, she said, well, I'm going uh, to see uh, Reverend K King uh, to figure out what to do next. So they were in a position where they really what, weren't clear uh, on their side what to do next. And so she said, uh, Kennedy said, uh, uh, do you tell uh, Reverend King to bring people to, to Washington? Uh, and they, in considerably large numbers and uh, that they will stay there until they, somebody does something about all these problems. That was, that's, that's what he poverty. said. And she took that to, to King uh, the very next day. And it was like to King that he was getting this angel coming. Uh, and that's, that's uh, where uh, the, the poor people's campaign actually came from Robert Kennedy. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, such an interesting convergence because Dr. King was thinking about having protests, you know, nonviolent protests in cities. I mean, he was thinking of other kinds of ways to protest and really help people nonviolently confront these issues. But that notion of poor people coming to Washington, that connection between what Kennedy was thinking and what King was clearly looking for, I think is really um, says, says quite a bit. And, you know, the last picture of my book is of the funeral uh, car taking Robert Kennedy's body by the Lincoln Memorial at night and it's stopping and the people who were gathered there in Resurrection City, the Poor People's Campaign, are singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So it's um, sort of a very sad 
uh, said ending, but the, the work that, that he did and King and others did during this decade, I think really shines across the time period to show what it takes and uh, uh, to really face issues and find ways to, uh, to try and move, move ahead. So I think maybe we should. Well, uh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Yes, uh, Brad, should we uh, see what, what questions we have? Sure, we have, uh, we have several so far. And, and while um, we're going through these, I'm gonna encourage uh, everyone watching to uh, go ahead and plant some more questions in the, in the, in the Q&A column at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Robin wants to know, Pat, how you initially came to study civil rights history. What drew you to this rich story? Uh, uh, what, what, was there an incident or a person who was a special influence? Yes, uh, terrific question. I, when I started out in graduate school many, many years ago, I was going to study immigration history, being the daughter of a granddaughter of Irish immigrants. And I had a professor who was writing a biography of Paul Robeson, who I didn't know very much about. And my job was to research Robeson's tours through the South in the 1940s and where he was connected with white and black Southerners who were really working in the early civil rights struggles of the, to the New Deal era. So I was off and, and Brad, you mentioned my first book was on the New Deal period. So all of these many people I met who were working in the federal government, the NACP and labor groups and the rest um, pulled me right in and I've had, you know, the lights came on when I was studying Paul Robeson and I really saw how central uh, this history is to understanding so much about American history. Uh, David uh, says um, RFK uh, has spawned organizations that continue his beliefs in the advancement of civil rights and racial equity. Uh, tell us about this, including his children's activities. Oh, well, I mean, he, Robert Kennedy's, that's a whole, that's several books, right? To really <laughs> research. And I'm aware of certainly of the RFK human rights and the remarkable and wonderful work uh, that is done. And, and, and the, you know, how that, that organization lifts up people doing great journalism, writing, uh, human uh, rights activities and all the rest. Um, the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights was founded uh, by a group in 1963 when President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy had lawyers to come talk about uh, getting the civil rights bill through. So I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, the, the impact of Robert Kennedy, his legacy in terms of people who knew him then and, 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 and uh, have, have learned about him since is, um, is broad. And, uh, and I think that would be actually a Really just, just a word, just, if I could, just uh, yeah. a word, of course, uh, the uh, children are doing a variety of things, but uh, uh, Carrie Kennedy uh, is running the, the uh, 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 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, yes. uh, is essentially uh, the, what the family uh, is, is doing it. So uh, I just would mention that specifically. No, definitely. I mean, that's foundational. Yeah. Uh, another question here asks, so, so why do you think, uh, Pat, that the appreciation of RFK that your book offers hasn't, hasn't been framed this way before? I think partly because I'm a student of African-American history. And so I came to him with that, you know, looking at, at the 60s through those experiences. And uh, this is a great question. I asked different questions of the history, but I think really African-American experience in this country opens up every area of American history to a, a richer and more dynamic assessment. And, um, and of course, the Black press was a huge resource for me uh, in my research, um, as, as well as interviews and the rest. But, but I think that is pretty much it. The um, Black press was an archive that hadn't really been delved into before for in this country. Oh, well, again, if, you, if you're looking like, if you're looking at the coverage of, um, President Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, you know, the Black Press, Jet Magazine, you have different, you know, people are, are having a different perspective on, on what's happening. And even in terms of civil rights, I mean, when President Kennedy was killed, I mean, Benjamin Mays wrote a column, Benjamin Mays, the great uh, theologian and, and educator and teacher of Martin Luther King, 
uh, that, you know, John Kennedy surpassed Abraham Lincoln because he really believed, you know, he, this had to be done, period. You know, not to say, the, you know, so he wasn't putting Lincoln down, but he was really elevating uh, the, the understanding and the courage, maybe the wrong, but leadership of, of, of JFK by 63. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but I think that's pretty much it. And, and uh, when you follow Robert Kennedy, as Peter said, you're going to watch, you're on the Ribicoff hearings. I'm shocked that people have not really dealt with the Ribicoff hearings. Six volumes, King test, you know, all kinds of people testify and, and bring information forward, um, as well as these field hearings as well. So um, that, that, that's pretty much, I think, probably helps to explain, explain that. Anybody wants to read that, it's in the Library of Congress. Oh, you can get it online. I mean, it's uh, how many volumes, Peter? It's probably 14. Six. Oh, six. I, I, I think it's six. Uh, maybe it's eight. That's well, a lot. Yeah. So this next question asks, um, after all your research, what questions uh, could, you, um, could you not get answers uh, 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 to about RFK? Hmm. Wow, that's a good one. Um, you know, I... I can't think of any offhand, and, and, and to think about it that way, I mean, studying Robert Kennedy and following him through this period opened up so much to me um, in terms of his, his life and, 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 and what his life intersected with and how it helps us see, see this period uh, in a more dynamic way. Um, but I, I really can't think of any specific questions offhand. I'm sure I've got some, but... Mm -hmm. Um, so Clark wants to know, had RFK remained attorney general and without the hindsight of LBJ declining to run for another term, would his rise as the party's candidate been as effective? Oh, gee, I don't know. That's, a, I mean, that's really interesting to think about. Um, you know, I think his coming to He'd stay. Well, if he had stayed as attorney general, if his brother had been president for the next, wow, yeah, that's that, that's sort of beyond my pay grade. But I, it is nice to think about. I mean, um, but I do think his, you know, decision to run for the presidency again, that is something that, you know, is really not understood. People are like, well, Eugene McCarthy wanted, he stepped in and took it away. You know, I mean, it was um, his decision to run for the presidency was so rooted in his concerns across the board, not just about the war, but about equally about uh, what was happening in our country and in the cities and around race and poverty. You know, Eugene McCarthy declared in November of 1967, and he gave his sp first speech on race on April 10th, 1968. So <laughs> mm -hmm. there was, uh, you know, a need for, uh, for that mm -hmm. uh, issue to, to come to the war. But. So Marie Ann asks, uh, which strategy of RFK would be most effective in uh, righting wrongs today? I think his, you know, his curiosity, his uh, trying to find out, to go, to see, to listen, to learn, to grow, uh, to understand the political process. Uh, to, to use all the levers at your command. I mean, just to whoever you are, not just in elected office, but you know, he loved talking with uh, students and he really looked to them. He said, you know, it's not a president that's going to really shape your future, it's you and you know, what you're committed to doing. And I think his, really his legacy is a woman, Elsie Richardson, who was one of the people who helped him with the Bedford-Stuyvesant project said, Robert Kennedy knew how to turn words into action. And I think that that's uh, do something, you know, and, and, and educate yourself. I mean, not in a formal sense, but get involved and understand and, uh, and act. Uh, you know, sort of uh, building on that question. I mean, there's some specific less lessons. I mean, if you were Merrick Garland today and racial justice and injustice is again, uh, high priority. Uh, mm -hmm. for this administration and for this Justice Department. Are there lessons that, that uh, Merrick Garland could look at in, in the way um, Robert Kennedy was Attorney General that he could, he could apply today? 
Probably, you know, and he may be doing that. I mean, it's, um, you know, Robert Kennedy was attorney general until 1964, but from the beginning, well, again, he was very close to his brother and they, you know, and people, you know, people's relation to the public service in the 1960s is a little different. I mean, people are committed to public service today, but, you know, the people who staffed the Justice Department, I mean, um, you know, going into the field, you know, uh, talking to people, organizing these uh, cases for voting rights. I think um, that would be something that, you know, would be important. I mean, building his team and uh, finding the openings uh, to act and being bold. I mean, you know, Kennedy was bold. I mean, he, he pushed the envelope. I mean, the Prince Edward County case, you know, they tried to, they closed the schools in Prince Edward County. He went and sued and they said, you know, you can't sue. You know, you, you don't have standing. It, Attorney General. So he organized, raised the money to open a school for um, all children in Prince Edward County. In the uh, it opens in the fall of 1963. So just moving on all fronts and and feeling a sense of urgency. And, and and certainly we have that now. And 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 trying different things and just pushing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all. Yeah, the I, can questions. I just uh, say one one thing, and uh, yeah, you, you maybe ahead. you know, and that's that President Biden has has uh, the uh, Robert Kennedy behind uh, on his uh, in his office. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's, that, that, that that says a lot, right there, doesn't it? No, I think yeah, so. It does. Sure. It does. Um, and, well, thank you both so much, Peter. Great moderating, and and Pat, you know, as Peter predicted at the start of the hour, it wasn't going to be possible to cover everything <laughs> that's in your book, but you and Peter touched on, on, on quite a bit. And, um, and I do hope people who haven't delved into the book will do so, uh, because it does provide an extensive and important fresh look at not only Robert Kennedy and his legacy, but at race and politics in the 1960s. Uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Justice Rising. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. <laughs>